I think it's interesting because that we know historically using traditional ultrasound guided 12 core biopsy that we understage and we undersample. We're, we sample just with our little 12 cores, we sample less than 1% of the prostate. We have a range anywhere from 8%, and this is the Hopkins data, anywhere from 8% to 25% upgrading and upstaging. Again, speaking to the heterogeneity of the disease, speaking to the basically lack of, of good imaging technique and biopsy technique. We, we understand that, again, there's, there, there's never been any sort of head-to-head -head trials with these tests, but the most recent joint guidelines from AUA, SUO, and ASTRO really said, again, despite this undergrading and understaging, they basically said that they didn't see a, a need for molecular testing in the, in the low-risk patient. Glenn, what are your thoughts on that? I think the NCCN guidelines talking about the low to very low risk, that's perhaps where it has the greatest utility because those are really the patients that struggle. Do they need to have a definitive treatment with all the attendant side effects, whether it's radiation or surgery, these patients do have significant quality of life issues. And if you have a low PSA and either a very low or a low risk based on your Gleason score, everyone's looking for one additional piece of information. And if the genomic test can eventually prove, and we're, we're not there yet. I mean, I agree the company's done a very good job putting data sets together, but we need to validate it in a much larger group of patients in the real world. If we could do that, that would make patients and their physicians much more comfortable with the decision, you can wait, you don't need treatment now, we'll put down active surveillance and follow that protocol. You know, um, Mike and Evan, as, as medical oncologists, obviously you guys generally historically are not involved in the, in the decision making for the, for the early, for the localized people with, with low grade disease. In your experience and in your practice, do you get a lot of patients that will come to you, walk in and say, hey doctor, you, what, you know, I've got diagnosed with prostate cancer, what do you, what do you think about this from, from a medical oncology standpoint. Yeah, occasionally we'll do be the tiebreaker, right? I mean, they'll <laughs> see a urologist who said we should do surgery, they'll see a radiation oncologist says we should do radiation, they go, I want to see a cancer doctor, okay? And we're supposed to break the tie. But I, I make most of my decisions on which treatment uh, based on side effects, quality of life, patient desires, okay? Um, the issue about whether you should be treated or not, um, I think you know, low risk prostate cancer should be observed. And I think the real question is, um, and I do believe it's a question mark, is, is how much benefit are these tests? Uh, I think uh, you pointed out nicely that for somebody who's low risk, you can find out whether you're really low risk or whether you're a little bit higher low risk. Uh, and people, what ends up happening is people that are a little bit higher low risk probably get some sort of treatment, rightfully or wrongfully so. But I think you know that that's the real point. Is in some ways it is uh, it helps alleviate anxiety. So we have to ask ourselves whether that's a good reason to do a test or not. You know, a question for Neil though. So the younger man with prostate cancer. You know, the older guy tends to sort of that. The younger man wants to you know preserve potency. Doesn't want incontinence. You know, so they might want active surveillance, but they have a long uh, life left uh, potentially. Uh, do these tests help in that situation to help them make that decision or make you feel more comfortable? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, it was a very nice paper that came out in New England. I, I, I don't want to misquote the hospital. It was just presented at AUA that active surveillance is absolutely a reasonable approach for men diagnosed under 55, where historically we've sort of had this notion that, oh, you're younger, you've got to get something because you have a longer time to live with the disease. You know, the key thing is, is, as Raul said earlier, this is not watchful waiting. This is active surveillance. And the, the surveillance protocols, there's, there's not unanimity about how to best to do it. But uh, the way I look at it is I don't want to inflict uh, the comorbidity or the consequences of surgery radiation to somebody who might have worsening voiding symptoms or sexual dysfunction don't want somebody to progress outside the prostate, so you're going to survey them regularly with follow-up biopsies, et cetera. And the data, it's mostly single institution, it's not super long, it's three to seven years in most institutions, is it's, a, it's low single digits, the percentages, the number of patients, if you reasonably surveying them, that you would lose an opportunity to ultimately treat them. 
And the other thing that I think about is over the course of time, we keep getting better and better with newer therapies that hopefully would be less morbid uh, and put patients at less risk. And then, of course, there's the issue that you know, something can happen to you along that time that you're being surveyed that makes it all moot anyway. So I, I really think that the um, markers um, are very, very helpful. We can talk and debate about you know, the, the economic utility, but I think the clinical utility is there. Too many of our colleagues have a hard time with the dialogue just based upon DRE, PSA, and Gleason score, and percentage, and number of cores. Getting a fourth independent variable to help further that education uh, to make a, the right decision, which could be to do active treatment. It's not always just to do surveillance. So. And, you know, plus, Neil, the, the endpoints of, of, of some of these tests are very different. You know, the endpoint of, of, of one test is, is basically the likelihood of dying of metastatic disease at 10 years, likelihood of progression. The end point of another test is the likelihood at the time, a set point in time, vis-a-vis -vis the time of biopsy, the presence or absence of unfavorable or favorable histopathology. So again, that even adds more to the confusion in terms of some of our, some of our partners and our colleagues. And I think the other thing that, that goes along with that is, is even, though you're on, even though we may recommend active surveillance, that it doesn't necessarily mean you'll never need to be treated. It just means that at this point in time, at the time of the biopsy right now, there's, there's nothing to indicate that you should go ahead and move on to treatment, but it could change in a year. And I think what's interesting, and, and we don't really have that data, is will these, you know, if you ordered the molecular test, I don't think anybody would ever advocate that, but you know, molecularly, would it, you know, could it change? You know, I, I think there's there's absolutely no data on that. So again, I think there, again, it's 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 another area where uh, we want the the viewing audience to understand that this is not it's not simple like our discussion earlier on genetic testing. It's not simple. There, there you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of dialogue. There's a lot of confusion. And again, I think for a lot of our a lot of our colleagues, that it's it's they really do have to take the time to, to understand the nuances of all these tests.